Hello, this is Professor Jackson. Today I'm going to review with you the first modules that's in the textbook, Exploring Psychology and Modules by Myers and Dewall. It's basically an overview of the field of psychology and certain um, body systems as well when we get closer to module three. first thing to address before we go into the field of psychology too far is, well, the social sciences as a whole. So you don't have to go very far into our history and see errors that have been made and conclusions that were drawn that with more information and more research and understanding, we have realized are not accurate. They are false um, and quite opposite really in some cases of what we now understand. So to understand the social sciences and, and the information that we draw from the research in those fields, it's kind of best to see and assess for a scientific attitude. That's, was the researcher humble? Were they open to other conclusions, perspectives? Were they skeptical? Did they really address the questions to try to understand how how is this occurring? How do we know this is occurring? occurring? Was there critical thinking going on? Looking for hidden biases? And so all of these things is what kind of referred to holistically as scientific attitude. Okay, so now let's talk about the origins of psychology. It is not from Freud. Actually, the father of psychology is considered to be Wilhelm Wundt, a German a researcher, actually. And in 1879, he had the first, well, social science laboratory where he did an experiment to measure the time it took for people to react in pressing a telegraph key after they heard a ball hit a platform. Both Want and Titchener ascribe to one of the early schools of thought with psychology, which is referred to as structuralism. It's using introspection to reveal the structure of the human mind. So if I'm using uh, structuralism, I may ask somebody, um, okay, what what are you thinking about this? Um, I'm getting that person to, to engage in introspection. The other early school of thought was functionalism, and this was provo uh, promoted by James and influenced by Darwin, so you're going to see it's going to be pretty different. And this was an exploration of how mental and behavioral processes function how they enable organisms, meaning humans as well, to adapt, survive, and flourish. So the two early schools of thought were structuralism and functionalism, with the father of psychology, Wilhelm Wundt, supporting and promoting structuralism. So let's talk a little bit more about Titchener and James. Edward Titchener as we stated before, wanted to discover the mind structure and particularly doing so by introspection. Unfortunately, this proved to be unreliable. Uh, also, James, that we referred to on the previous slide, we already said that he was influenced by Charles Darwin, and he tended to look more at thinking in terms of uh, adaptive biological functions, evolved functions. He also, one interesting thing about James is he admitted a woman named Mary Calkins to his graduate seminar. And this was at a time where women were still not accepted very often in higher education. And so actually he was at Harvard and Harvard's president objected to this. He did it anyway. And as a result, all of the men dropped out of um, out of his course. And so he tutored her alone. The one interesting thing about Mary Calkins was not only was she 
a pioneer in terms of memory research. But she actually was the first woman president of the American Psychological Association, and she earned that title in 1905. But she was denied her graduate degree by Harvard, even though she completed all the requirements, because she was female. So this brings us to another woman that's important in the history of psychology, Margaret Washburn. She was the first woman to receive a doctorate in psychology, not the first one to earn it, but the first one to actually receive it. And she conducted a lot of animal research looking at behavior. Also some important psychologists is Watson and Skinner. They also studied behavior. They rejected the earlier thoughts of introspection. They particularly look at, at conditioned responses. And this came Looking at this in that way, they they basically put together this new field in psychology that which would become known as behaviorism. And so this is a a social science that studies behavior without referencing mental processes. And most psychologists today agree with the first part that psychology should be an objective science that looks at behavior, but they disagree that it should not reference mental processes, that, that it should include kind of both. So now let's talk about the one psychologist which you probably have heard of before, which is Sigmund Freud. He has very controversial ideas related, related to personality theory. So, a lot of his ideas were related to personality development, that part of human development theories. His emphasis was on what he referred to as the unconscious thought process, like the id, the ego, the superego, emotional responses to childhood and how that affects our behavior. And he had psychosexual stages that he believed was what contributed to um, personality development. Enter in Carl Rogers and Abraham Maslow. They actually took a different approach and formed what's called humanistic psychology. This really emphasized the potential that humans have. So it's a very strength-based approach. It also, in humanistic psychology, they look at the current environment, how that influences us to, to nurture us so that we can reach our full potential. And they really emphasize the importance of having needs met, um, including the need for love and acceptance. And so when you hear of hierarchy of needs, that's referring back to their work. Then in the 1960s, there is an emergence of cognitive psychology. This is more of an exploration of how humans perceive and process and remember information. Also, it looks at the cognitive roots for things like anxiety, depression, or um, other psychological disorders. There's also something called evolutionary psychology. This looks at how human beings are alike because of our biology and our evolutionary history. It's a study of evolution of behavior, including the mind. It uses principles such as natural selection. One thing in psychology is still this kind of nature nurture issue. It is controversial that the, the contributions that our biology have, our genes, versus the contributions to human development in terms of our experiences, our life experiences, and how that influences our, our personality, our behaviors, our traits. So today's science sees traits and behaviors arriving, rising from the interaction of both nature and nurture. In terms of culture, culture is typically defined as the behaviors, ideas, attitudes, values, and traditions shared by a group. Not just currently, but it also needs to go from generation to generation. So it goes past um, 
generationally. Another field is positive psychology. This looks at human functioning, promoting strengths and virtues that help not only individuals, but also communities to thrive. Then there's the field of neuroscience, which you may have heard of before. It's how the body and the brain enable emotions and memories and these different sensory experiences. There's even something um, that's used today called neurofeedback. Uh, we don't really get too far into that in this course, but these are just different things to be aware of. Now, modern psychology is the study of both behavior and mental processes. So a modern psychology, we would look at behavior and mental processes. So I would observe what a person does, how they react, are they showing anger, excessive emotionality, but I'd also look at their perceptions, their thoughts, their feelings. So it's including both behavior and mental processes. As you've seen, psychology's roots are in, kind of go across different disciplines, right? We talked about Darwin and things like that, but mostly it's established from two different disciplines, which is philosophy and biology. So it spans across both of those. All right, so now let's talk about levels of analysis. And levels of analysis, you basically have three domains. You have the biological, the psychological, and the social cultural. This ends up being the biopsychosocial approach. You notice all three of those. It's an integrated viewpoint incorporating various levels of analysis and offers a more complete picture of any given behavior or mental process. So when you're looking at biological influences, you're gonna look at genetic, genetic predispositions, genes. Um, let me, I'm just trying to think of different things related to that. Uh, you're going to look at psychological influences. Are there any kind of learned responses that this person has? What are their emotional responses? And you're also going to look at social cultural influences like their family, their culture, their peer group, what kind of models they had for them, even in media. And then all three of these together is the biopsychosocial approach with the three levels of analysis. Now I want to talk about the different subfields of psychology. On this slide, we're going to talk about counseling psychologists, clinical psychologists, and psychiatrists. Counseling psychologists, as the name implies, will engage in more of a counseling focus with clients, talk about things related to problems in their lives or them trying to achieve a greater sense of well-being in their lives. Clinical psychologists will focus more on diagnosing and treating people with particular psychological disorders that we have available to us in what's called the DSM-5. It's a diagnostic manual with the different disorders listed in it. Psychiatrists are actually very unique in the field of psychology because they're actually a branch of medicine. And so these are actually physicians, medical physicians, who provide different treatments, relate, they can do therapy as well, but they are unique in that they can prescribe prescriptions and different types of medications and drugs, which psychologists cannot do. That wraps up module one. Now we're gonna move on to module two. All right, so we're gonna start by talking a little bit more about research. We've touched on this briefly in the module one. Here, we're gonna go into a lot uh, more depth. So there's certain things that will get in the way of research, different effects that are present. One is intuition. It's the automatic feeling, thought, you know, someone's gut feeling. There is some interesting research that you can read. We don't really go over it too much in this course, but it's actually about how this applies to, to getting hired, to, to interviewing, to, to job applicants. And the person doing the hiring, 
there's plenty of, of cases where that person goes not on the data, on the resume, on on the actual information, but they go with what their gut, you know, feels or what they think. And and it doesn't take into account um, what's well, a bias. They're they're feeling that their gut feelings correct based on different kind of past experiences, but then they're ignoring all the information they don't have, right? The time where they passed over a particular applicant and that applicant actually went on over to company X and is now the president of that company and, you know, exceeded everybody's expectations. Well, you know, that person doesn't have that information, right? And so they go with their intuition because what they've observed reinforced that their intuition is something to go off of. There is another thing called hindsight bias. This is the I knew it all along bias. An example of this would be, let's say you're going into a basketball game and I don't know, you saw a lucky quarter. And so you're like, yeah, look at this lucky quarter. We're going to win this game. And you actually do win the game. And so once you win the game, then you go, yeah, see, I knew it. I knew we were going to win. Well, you didn't know you're going to win. Because if you lost the game, you go, oh, uh, yeah, that wasn't a lucky quarter then, right? And so it's only after the fact that you go, oh, yeah, see, I knew it. I knew it all along. That's called hindsight bias. There's also overconfidence, and just like the name implies, it is another type of effect on research. It's this really human tendency that we engage in to think that we know more than we actually do. And the example of this could be maybe someone's going on a trip, going for a drive, and they're very, they're overconfident that they are great with directions. They're great with gauging their sense of direction. And they get lost. And they refuse to get out their GPS or to look at something because, you know, they can figure it out because they have this great sense of direction. Um, it's also people that just think they are much smarter than they actually are. And so overconfidence, though, also applies to psychology and to, to research, thinking that we know more than what we do. Now, in the field of research, we do apply the scientific method. You've probably gone over this ever since high school, if not earlier. So I'm not going to spend too much time on it. But there's a theory and a formed hypothesis, something that can be tested. And then there is what's called replication. Now, this may be something that you haven't done before. So replication is the ability to repeat a research study. So if Jones over here did a research study and she laid it all out exactly what she did, then I should be able to go in and replicate that study to do the same thing, just using different participants, the ones that I can find. And then I see if the finding that Jones found if my research ends up with the same finding. And so that's actually kind of a, a strong, when, when the study's been replicated multiple times and the results are all similar, then that generally becomes a very strong finding. There's also something called case study research. This is a type of study that's done, it's considered a qualitative type of approach where you either take an individual, or a group or a company, for those of you who are going into that field, and you study it in depth. You really look at this one, and typically a case study, you're looking at it because it's unique in some way. So if there was, let me think, a university, I don't know, that had some kind of particular tragedy, I may go to that university and, and really study it and, and look at the dynamics of it to see if I can understand if that tragedy occurred because of something unique in that situation, right? It could also be a company. If a company is excelling, they they're went from being a brand new company to 
you know, the top 50 companies in the whole United States within like five years, right? That, that would be a great case study because it's a very unique situation and you look at it in depth to try to understand, you know, what is this company doing that's causing them to be so successful and, and can these principles be applied to other companies to help them be more successful, right? That would come from a case study. There is naturalistic observation and just as it describes, it is this process of observing and describing what you deserve, you observe, recording all the behaviors that you see in a particular situation. And, and the researcher here does not control anything or try to change anything. It is simply observing. So if I was engaging in this and I wanted to understand relationships on a college campus, I might go sit in a dorm and, and watch how couples engage. I might go sit in the quad and watch how couples engage, sit in the cafeteria and watch how couples engage. And, and I would write down all my different observations. Survey research is probably the most common that you're familiar with. It is a self-report type research. So it's also not considered the strongest type. Um, because the, the individuals that are filling out the surveys, you know, they're just reporting what they think of themselves, right? So using that example about dating, I can observe if, if someone's being very rude or angry with, with their partner. But if you gave them a questionnaire or survey, they may fill it out that, you know, that, that kind of behavior is normal for them. So no, it's not angry because anger to them is a very heightened, elevated type of anger, right? So that you run into those kind of issues with surveys. There's also something called wording effects. So let's say I say, does your, do you feel like your, your significant other supports you, right? Well, what does support mean to you? And what it means to you is probably different than what it means to me and to the other person taking the survey, right? The example here I gave is aid to the needy or welfare. If I say, you know, do you believe in giving aid to the needy or do you believe in welfare? You might have those two phrases, those two, one word and one phrase actually, might have very different meanings for you. So that's gonna change the way you answer the question. and. And what I mean as the researcher by writing down welfare aid to the needy has a meaning to me as well. And maybe that meaning to you is different. So all that's to say, whenever you see research that is survey results, you should really think about that critically, consider who they, they had take the surveys, maybe even look at the survey but I would just, I wouldn't take it as strong as I would, let's say a case study. Now let's talk a little bit about statistics. We're not gonna go too far into it because this is not a math class, but we do need to understand correlation if you're gonna understand social science research. So correlation simply is a measure of how two factors, two variables are related to one another. How strong is that relationship to one another? So you will end up with a correlation coefficient, which is a statistical uh, index number, et cetera, of a relationship between two variables, okay? So X and Y, height and weight, um, length of, time dating and um, percentages of divorce, right? So you're gonna have these two variables that you look at. And when you run the statistical analysis on this to look for a correlation coefficient, you're gonna end up with a number between negative one and one. A positive correlation, so zero to positive one, means that there is a relationship where as one increases, the other increases. So it's a positive linear relationship. Well, if it was a perfect one, it would be. So as height increases, typically weight increases, right? And so that would be a positive correlation, somewhere between 
well actually it has to be above zero because zero means there's no correlation whatsoever so anything above zero to positive one now these numbers are important and we'll talk about negative correlation here in a minute but first understand this number whether it's a little bit above zero to positive one or a little bit below zero to negative one the closer it gets to one or the closer it gets to negative one is the stronger the relationship so if i look at oh let me think how many donuts i ate today and if the dodgers won you know how many games the dodgers won this year right that those things might actually come out correlated maybe the more donuts i ate today the more games the dollar the dodgers won this year um but it's probably going to be like a point one right so the closer it is to zero the the less of that strength and that correlation is now the positive the closer it is to one the stronger the strength is so if there is a study that shows a 0.85 uh, positive correlation coefficient between two variables x and y a and b whatever it is then that's telling you that's a very strong relationship between those two variables one of the ones i can think of right now is for you college students is the amount of time spent studying and grades that has a very high positive correlation so the more time that's spent studying the higher the gpa right negative correlation is kind of the inverse of this same thing applies the closer it gets to negative one the more positive the relationship but it goes in different directions so as one variable increases the other one decreases so the more time that you spend gaming or being on social media or on your phones or any sort of those kind of electronic distra distractions is you know a very high negative let's just say 0.8 correlation with your gpa with your grades so as one goes up the more time that you spend on screens the other one goes down probably the lower GPA so that is a negative correlation now correlations are are telling us that two things are related but it does not prove that one has a cause-effect relationship all we know is that these two variables are related in how strong that relationship is right if it's very close to a positive one or negative one or if it's closer to zero but it does not tell us that this absolutely causes this and so it's not it doesn't prove causation it just shows a relationship and that's something really important uh, to understand when you read different research all right now with all of that let's say now a psychologist is gonna do an experiment and this experiment there must be a researcher or investigator and they're gonna and now now this type of experimentation is what we call quantitative um they're going to take something an independent variable something they can manipulate ma manipulate change and they're going to observe the effect that that has on a dependent variable something that that they don't manipulate that they don't change experiments are are great they help researchers to to look at different effects between different variables to see you know what happens when they change this so much or change that so much and and what it has on on the dependent variable on the constant in order to do experiments though the kind of the best sampling strategy is to do random this is just exactly as it sounds it's by chance and 
participants either go into the experimental group or what's called a control group. So an experimental group is the one that actually gets the treatment. It's the one that actually gets the, the educational intervention, right? Uh, the one that actually gets the, the new type of therapy to help with depression. And so that would be the experimental group. The control group, though, does not get that intervention. They don't get that treatment. They don't get that new type of, of therapy for depression. And then the, the investigator, the researcher, will look at the difference between these two groups because in theory, right, if there's this great new counseling approach, then the experimental groups should have lower um, depressive symptoms at the end of it than the control group, right? There is something though that's called the placebo effect, and I'm sure you've heard of this before. So especially when it comes to kind of medicinal experiments, I'm going to give this group uh, this this new antidepressant and this other group, I'm going to give them basically a sugar pill, right, that has uh, none of the, the pharmaceutical properties in it, but let's say people in the control group after taking the sugar pill start reporting that they have less symptoms and they start having less symptoms and, and well, that may be the cause from a, what we call placebo effect. And so it's the expectation that someone has that if I take this medicine, I'll, I'll feel better. Right, I'll, I'll get better. I'll, it's because it, because the the participants don't know if they're getting the real medicine or not, and so this kind of influences. Well, one, it shows the control of our thoughts, but it also influences the the outcomes of research because then it's hard to tell how much the the medication actually helped. So I talked to you about the independent variable, the one that's changed or manipulated. There's also something called, and, and I, I told you about the dependent variable, I'm sorry, um, which is what we're actually measuring. But there is something called a confounding variable. And the confounding variable is interesting. It's, it's not what's being studied, but it may produce an effect. So let's say I had my control group and my experimental group. I'm, I'm looking at, um, let's see, depressive symptoms. But let's say I do it during the months of December and January, right? Where, when people have, well, some people have elevated um, symptoms of depression during that particular, that seasonal depression. And so let's say I start conducting my study during then, and then come February and March, as my study's still going on, a lot of the people that were in the control group that weren't getting any treatment, their symptoms started subsiding. And I didn't know that their depression was caused by, you know, seasonal affective disorder, right? And so, that would be a confounding variable, something that, that's impacting my study, but it's not something that I sought out to, to, it wasn't a factor that was to be studied. All right, that wraps up module two. Now we're gonna move on to module three. Now module three, we're gonna go more into the biology. This would be biological psychologists that, that study this link between what's going on between biology and behavior. One of the key things with this is our nervous system and particularly neurons. Neurons are the building blocks of our nervous system. And throughout life, you have new, neur new neurons, but then also unused neurons wither away. Dendrites are part of the neuron. It's the bushy branching extension. And the dendrites are the ones that receive messages and different impulses. The axons are neuron extensions that pass the messages. through. They do this through 
what's called branches and they pass these messages to other neurons or to muscles or to glands. So you have these dendrites, you have these axons, you then you have synapses. And this is the little junction between an axon tip of the sending neuron and the dendrite or the cell body of a receiving neuron. And this tiny gap at this junction is the synaptic gap, sometimes called synaptic cleft. And then there's neurotransmitters. And these are, well, I'm sure you actually heard of these actually before. They're the chemical messengers that cross these synaptic gaps between the neurons. They're re when they're released by the neuron that's sending them, the neurotransmitters travel across the synapse bind to receptor sites on the receiving neuron and then they influence whether that neuron will will create or generate a neural impulse. One of the kind of best understood neurotransmitters is ACH. It plays a role in both learning and memory and is a messenger at every junction between major neurons and skeletal muscles. When ACH is released into muscle cell receptors, the muscle contracts. If ACH transmission is blocked, which, well, which happens when you get um, certain types of anesthesia, uh, but also different types of poisons, um, the muscle cannot contract and you're paralyzed. So, well, I'll, I'll go ahead and say this. So it's kind of interesting with that, that um, there are certain types of poisoning that paralysis comes by, by blocking ACH receptors. Morphine actually mimics endorphin actions. And so let's talk a little bit about this on our next one. So let's understand endorphins. Endorphins do a couple of different things. They lessen your pain. They boost mood. And so you may be asking yourself, then why not? Why not flood the brain with artificial opiates so we can intensify this, this feel-good chemistry in our brain? There's a problem with that. So when a brain is flooded with opiate drugs such as heroin or morphine, to maintain a chemical balance, the brain will stop producing its own natural opiates. So therefore, when the drug is taken away, the brain is then deprived from opiates, right, because it stopped producing its own, and this causes intense discomfort. This is why things like heroin or morphine are, are very hard to withdraw from. Let's see, uh, let's talk about agonist molecules. They will increase neurotransmitters action and may increase the production or release of neurotransmitters or block the reuptake in the synapse. Antagonists decrease a neurotransmitter's action by blocking production or release. Serotonin, dopamine, and endorphins are all chemical messengers. They are all neurotransmitters. And the central nervous system includes not only the brain, but also the spinal cord. Nerves are bundled axons that form these neural cables connecting the central nervous system with your muscles, your glands, and your sense organs. So let's talk about the peripheral nervous system. There are two components. You got somatic and autonomic. The somatic nervous system is part of the peripheral nervous system and it controls your skeletal muscles. The autonomic nervous system is also part of your peripheral nervous system, but it controls your glands and muscles of internal organs, including your heart. There is the 
sympathetic division, this is what arouses and expends energy. It dilates your pupils, accelerates your heartbeat, it inhibits digestion, it does uh, stimulate the release of glucose in your liver. It also um, stimulates secretion of epinephrine, neuroepinephrine, it relaxes your bladder. You got your parasympathetic, that what calms the body, contracts your pupils, slows your heartbeat, stimulates digestion, your gallbladder, and contracts the bladder. You can see how <laughs> these different systems um, relate to being awake, right, and to sleep. All right, our last slide for module three is about the endocrine system. The endocrine system, though, is your second communication system to your nervous system that we just covered. There is a difference, though, in that the endocrine system secretes hormones through your bloodstream. The nervous system does those electrical impulses. The other thing is that the nervous system, the, the messages are, are faster than the messages that the endocrine system has, but the endocrine system's messages will linger longer, typically, than the messages sent by the nervous system. And so what are these hormones, right? What, what, what hormones are going on with the endocrine system? Well, when the endocrine system secretes the hormones that go through the bloodstream that, that influence the brain, it can influence the brain on things like, like food, but also aggression. And the hormones can be chemically identical to neurotransmitters, the neurotransmitters that we talked about uh, previously in this module. And so that can excite or inhibit, right, a neuron. So endocrine messages then, because they outlast the neural messages, will explain why when we have upset feelings, those feelings actually may linger longer than even our, our awareness of what upset us. Um, when, when this endocrine system has come into play and these upset feelings are lasting longer, right? then when this happens, it takes time because those messages last longer for someone to calm down, simmer down, et cetera. I think I heard some one time that it was about 15 minutes for the body to, to simmer down, to calm down. So that's our last system to discuss here. And I know that was a lot, but feel free to review the, the PowerPoint or the lecture as often as needed.